Chapter 10, Carthage and Numidia, Carthage. In the 9th century BC, the city-state of Carthage was established. It was situated on the North African coast of modern Tunisia. In common Phoenicians, the early people of Palestine, founded it and called it Kart Hadasht, Carthage, their new town, as opposed to Utica, also located in North Africa, their old town. Other influences in the culture came from different sources. The Libyans, the indigenous people of North Africa, played an important and ultimately the dominant role. Moreover, the peoples and cultural practices came from the Nile Valley. What was the resulting mix? Anthropologists have studied skeletons from Carthage and cemeteries. Professor Eugene Pittard, then at the University of Geneva, reported that other bones discovered in Punic, Carthage, and housed in the Levirgi Museum come from personages found in special sarcophagi and probably belonging to the Carthaginian elite. Almost all the skulls are dolichocephalic. Furthermore, the sarcophagus of the highly venerated priestess of Tenet, the most ornate and the most artistic yet found, is also housed in the La Vigiri Museum. Pittard says the woman buried there had Negro features. She belonged to the African race. Professor Stefan Gissel was the author of the voluminous Histoire Asian de la Afrique du Nord. Also based on anthropological studies conducted on the Carthaginian skeletons, he declared that the so-called Semitic type, characterized by long, perfectly oval face, the thin aquiline nose, and the lengthened cranium, enlarged over the nape of the neck, has not yet been found in Carthage. Herodotus, the well-traveled ancient Greek historian, discussed the origin of the Phoenicians. This nation, said he, according to their own account, dwelt anciently upon the Erythian Sea, but crossing thence, fixed themselves on the sea coast of Syria, i.e. Palestine, where they still inhabit. Lady Luggard, an outstanding authority on African antiquities, supports the view that the Phoenicians were of distant Eurasian origins. She declared that the Phoenicians are de- believed to have migrated from Erythia on the coast of Red Sea about 2000 BC to the Mediterranean where they were first established on the strip of Syria. The earliest known inhabitants of Palestine were the Natufians. Flourishing some 10,000 years ago, they were Negroes. Sir Arthur, Arthur Keith, the great British anthropologist, described them thus, Mediterraneans with a distinct bias towards the African variety of that stock represented by the pre-dynastic people of Egypt. More recently, Donald Redford echoed the same point. He wrote, This culture was a product of human type of slight build with long heads, Dalichocephalic, that have confidently been classified as Homo sapiens. Natufians, the modern Bantus, practice evulsion evulsion of the incisors and apparently wore skins and at times headgear made of shells. The Bible calls their descendants several thousand years later, Canaanites. Canon Rawlinson says of the Canaanites, these people, a Hamitic race closely connected with the Egyptians, Ethiopians, and primitive Babylonians, spread itself as a remote date over the entire coast tract from the borders of Egypt to Cassius, and formed the dominant population as far inland as the Syrian Valley, the Lake of Genesaret, and the deep cleft of the Jordan. In Greek accounts, the people of this area were called Phoenicians. This name refers to the dark red or brown dye, which the Greeks later used to denote the color of the Phoenicians. This may imply that that by the Greek period, the Phoenicians had become a mixed population having started out as black and ending up brown or dark red. Rawlinson, however, takes the view that the Phoenicians were not the same population as the Canaanites. Like Luggard, he accepts they migrated there 2000 BC, but believes instead that they came from the east. His evidence for this comes from the migration theory reported by Herodotus. But instead, Rawlinson identifies the Erythian Sea as the Persian Gulf and not the Red Sea. The problem here is that the people of Bahrain, even today, are Negroid. Moreover, the other peoples living along the coastline of the Persian Gulf are also dark-skinned. Professor Van Sertema sensibly advises caution here because, I have found no authority in fact who could precisely define the Phoenicians, And that is because they are not a race but a nation, a conglomerate of peoples who became distinctive through nationhood as a separate entity. Even if they were originally Africans, that is not helpful when we come to deal with them in the first millennium BC. To say that the American was originally Asian is not telling us anything about the American racial composition today or even 300 years ago. 
There are, however, a series of ivories that depict the Phoenicians in the British Museum. Carved in the 9th century BC, the majority of the Nimrud ivories depict the Phoenicians as Negroes. Professor Lancel, an excellent modern authority, reports that the tradition of ivory carving was carried into Carthage and great efforts were made to preserve the Phoenician int integrity of this style. Much, uh, much of the art of Carthage shows Egyptianizing or Hellenizing, i.e. Greek, tendencies and thus fails to faithfully represent either the Phoenician or Libyan populations. There are statues and depictions of people on coins that follow one or other tendencies. Mr. Wayne Chandler, an African-American scholar, gives an example of this. He demonstrates that the Hellensing portraits of the Buddha depict him as a European. Dr. Lancel claims the Carthaginian ivories were different. The open-work ivories of Carthage appear to be in direct descent from the Nimrud pieces dated to the end of the 8th century BC. Professor Lancel shows two ivories recovered from the Bisra Cemetery at Carthage. One of them was in the Egyptian tizing style and shows two people. Lancel says of it, The Cushitic features are very noticeable in the way the two people are portrayed. The other ivory depicted an animal and was, according to Lancel, in a Syrio-Palestinian tradition. The problem here is that the two styles that Lancel identifies are both present in the Nimrud ivories of the century earlier. We therefore conclude that the Cushitic features depicted on the Bisra Cemetery ivory also shows great fidelity to the Syrio-Palestinian models. In closing, the Phoenician question, we note that there is an official description of the sarcophagus of Esmanazar II, king of the Phoenician city of Sidon, and, um, and one of the Phoenicia's most illustrious rulers. It reads as follows. The features are Egyptian with large, full almond-shaped eyes, the nose flattened, at, and the lips remarkably thick and somewhat after Negro mold. The whole countenance is smiling. Agreeable and expressive beyond anything I have ever seen in the disinterred monuments of Egypt or Nivea. The Phoenicians were the great maritime traders of the ancient world. Mr. R. Bosworth Smith, author of the excellent Carthage and the Carthaginians, says of them, It was they who learned to steer their ships by the sure help of the pole star. While the Greeks still depended on the constellation of the Great Bear, it was they who rounded the Cape of Storms, of South Africa and earned the best right to call it the Cape of Good Hope 2,000 years before Vasco da Gama. Their ships returned to their native shores bringing with them sandal wood from Malabar in India, spices from Arabia, fine linen from Egypt, ostrich plumes from the Sahara, ebony and ivory from the Sudan, Cyprus gave them copper, Elba its iron, iron, the coast of the Black Sea its manufactured steel, Silver they brought from Spain, gold from the Niger, tin from the Sicily Isles, and amber from the Baltic. Where they sailed, there they planted factories which opened a caravan route with the interior of vast continents hitherto regarded as inaccessible, and which became inaccessible for centuries when the Phoenicians disappeared from history. Among the colonies they found it were Lyxis, Cadiz, Utica, and Carthage, Pliny the Elder reported that the Moroccan settlement of Lyxis was founded at an early date. Velius Paterculus reports that Cadiz, located on the Spanish coast, was established in 1110 BC. Pliny states that in Utica, on the North African coast, wooden beams of Numidian cedar were placed in the Temple of Apollo in 1101 BC. Does this date Utica to 1101 BC? No one seems to know, but this seems a fairly reasonable conjecture to make. Pseudo-Aristotle claimed that the Carthage followed Utica by 287 years. This seems to imply a date of 814 BC for the founding of Carthage. The ancient writers, Timaeus of Tomornia, Menander of Ephesus, and Justin seem in general agreement with this date. There were, there were other Phoenician colonies. Salus, a Latin historian echoing Phoenician sources, suggests that the North African settlements of Hippo, Hadramentinum, and Leptis, Magna, were founded at an early date. Menander of Ephesus names King Ethobal of Tyre as founding the settlement of Azul in North Africa in the first half of the 9th century BC. On the Mediterranean island of Sardinia, archaeologists have discovered a Phoenician stele at the site of Nora. 
It is the oldest known Phoenician inscription in the Western Mediterranean and is dated to the later half of the 9th century BC. Professor Lancel of the University of Grenoble discusses other early finds. Off the southern coast of Sicily was discovered a bronze statuette at the site of Selenut. At first it was seen as the god Melkart, the Greek Hercules, the Latin Hercules. In fact, this figurine belongs in a series of representations of what Middle East archaeologists call a smiting god. The god striding towards the enemy and preparing to smite him with a weapon brandished in his right hand. If it is permissible to recognize it as a divinity of syrio palestinian world, a Baal or Reshef rather than Melkart, it is equally permissible to turn it into a testimony of Phoenician expansion in the West. The statuette also wears a crown not unlike the white crown of the pharaohs. In addition, he is wearing a kilt, again not unlike those of the pharaohs. At Cadiz was found some problematic discoveries such as the figure of what seems to be a ta elsewhere in Spain near Alamecar. There was a cremation cemetery containing contains tombs dating from the end of the 8th century BC, but with an Egypt aspect strongly indicated by alabaster jars bearing pharaonic cartouches belonging to the 9th century, while one of them shows alongside pseudo-hieroglyphic inscriptions a text in Phoenician. We note that the archaeological evidence of the smiting god, the Ta, and the 9th century pharaonic cartouches are sh all show that the Nile Valley culture was an important and largely inseparable element in some of the Phoenician colonies. The founding of Carthage in 814 BC is associated with a moving story concerning events taking place in the Phoenician city of Tyre. There, King Pygmalion of Tyre murdered Akibas, the husband of Alyssa. She fled Tyre with some of its leading citizens and loyal followers. Her fleet landed on the island of Cyprus, where she earned the name of Dido. Moreover, she rescued 80 virgins from the bondage of, the, of a sacred prostitution from its temple of Venus. On arriving on the North African coast of modern Tunisia, envoys from nearby Utica gave their blessings and brought gifts. From Tyre, Elissa brought liturgical artifacts for the worship of Melkart. This also preserved the memory of her murdered husband, who was himself a priest of that deity. Hierobus king of the Libyans, wanted to marry Alyssa, but she refused, remaining loyal to her dead husband. Instead, she sacrificed herself on a funeral pyre that she had lit. Is there any truth in this story? Mrs. Erskine, an authority of North African history, seems to think so. She believes. We can accept Dido, whose real name was Eliza, or something like that, as a historical personage, personage most writers do, and we must admit that if she fled from Tyre on an account of plebeian rising against patricians or for any other motive, the most likely place for her to choose as a new home would be the African coast. It was not only fertile and desirable as a country, it was a land already colonized by her compatriots. Virgil, the Roman writer, adds that Aeneas and his followers fled a burning Troy and landed at Carthage. There, Elissa received them. She went further. She showered the visitors with presents and hospitality. Moreover, she fell madly in love with the somewhat indifferent Aeneas. Sadly, he was called away from Carthage to fulfill other duties. It was at this point that Alyssa commits suicide. Is this part of the story true? Mrs. Erskine comments. St. Augustine, i.e. the African theolo theologian of the 4th century AD, was exercised about this very point, as he tells us in his confessions. When he was a young man studying Carthage, he used to ask ignorant people if Aeneas had ever visited Carthage, to which they would reply that they did not know. When he asked the learned the same question, they replied in the negative. The saint's comments on tears that had, he had shed over a tragedy that never took place was, the education, was that education is being conducted along the wrong lines. The tradition that links Dido or Elissa to Tyre certainly highlights the cultural link between Carthage and its parent city. It became a custom for the Carthaginians to send an embassy to Tyre to celebrate a sacrifice in the temple of Melkart. They sent one-tenth of the city's revenue. They also sent extraordinary gifts from time to time, such as a booty-sized in Sicily and a bronze statue of Apollo. 
In the 17th century, in the 7th century BC, Carthage was a modest city of mud brick walling and beaten clay floors that already occupied a sizable part of the littoral plain, hundreds of meters in both directions, not to mention the possible occupation of the heights of Bisra, a suburban fringe of workshops, metal workers, foolers, dyers, potters, ensure the production necessary for daily living and already perhaps as regards pottery, for example, for export as well. The building alignments discovered show that at least in the central parts of the littoral plain, other orientations still seem questionable. In the 7th century BC, the settlement was not established in a haphazard fashion, but followed a generalized layout roughly parallel to the shoreline. By the beginning of the 7th century BC, the Libyans had become the majority population in the city. Dr. Lancel writes, Certain ritual practices observable in the inhumation graves reflect the Libyan contribution, which probably formed an important and surely even a majority component of Carthage's population at the beginning of the 7th century. Some three or four generations after the city's foundation, assuming the tradition of date of 814 BC for the founding of the city. The Libyan influence is not the only cultural factor, however. Professor Lancel reports that statues and tombs in a vaguely Egyptian style have been recovered dating to the middle, century, middle 7th century BC. Golden jewelry of Egyptian origin was found dating to a 17, 7th or 6th century BC and was locally made jewelry in an Egyptian style. Ivory was found where, again, the influence of Egyptian iconography is revealed. Moreover, thousands of scarabs and amulets dating to the 7th and 6th centuries BC were recovered. Among these were Wajet eyes, Ure, and images of Nile Valley deities. There were images of Ta, Bes, Anubis, Ma, Basta, and Amun. More intriguing were images of the specifically Numen, Nubian deity Num, Knum. 20, 26 dynasty scarabs were also discovered. Dr. Lancel says of these, the Sciatic Epoch, i.e. the 26th dynasty, with strong leanings towards the Archaic, have, try, have tried hard to revive the golden age of Egyptian civilization, and it will be of no surprise to find the name Mykonos, i.e. Menkara, the builder of one of the three great pyramids of Giza, on a blue-green paste scarab from the Dome Cemetery. The professor does not explore whether these archaic tendencies could not also have been brought to Carthage from 25th dynasty, since it is well known that it was they who started the, archaea the archaeizing process. In addition, being Kushites, they were more likely to have venerated Konum. Finally, there is evidence that Taharko, the great 12 25th dynasty, conquered as far as Spain. Carthage must have therefore been within the sphere of influence. By the end of the 7th century BC, Carthage began to face the first of the many challenges from Europe. The Greeks began to dispute the mastery of the Western Mediterranean. Already by the 8th century BC, they had colonies on the Campania and the island of Ischia. They sought to conquer markets and create trade routes. Moreover, they wanted the mineral wealth of the Isle of Elba and also Etruria. They occupied the Straits of Messina and gained control over the access to the Tyrrhenian Sea. Before long, they had colonies on the east coast of Sicily, and particularly the cities of Syracuse and Gela. In the second half of the 7th century BC, they founded Cyrene in Libya. This factor limited how far to the east the Phoenicians could expand in Africa. Finally, the Greeks established the colonies in Marseilles and also Malaga. Carthage established a colony in Ibiza in 654 BC. From the 6th century BC, Carthage was in control of a variety of territories. Some of these were colonies it had established, but others originally belonged to the Phoenicians but passed into the Carthaginian hands without conflict. The Phoenician city of Tyre fell in 573 BC. Carthage became the leading Phoenician city on losing its parent. Carthage is known to have controlled Malta from the 6th century until 218 BC. It controlled Gozo and Lampedusa from the least from at least the 6th century BC. Phoenicians had already settled Sardinia in the 9th century BC. In addition, superb gold and silver jewelry were recovered, dating to the 7th and 6th century BCs. Justin reports that the Carthaginian king Malchus defeated 
the restless natives of that island in the 6th century BC. Moreover, Hasdrubal and Hamilcar, two sons from the house of Mago, campaigned there. Finally, beginning in the 6th century and certainly in the 5th century BC, Carthage extended its boundaries into Africa. This developed a Libya Phoenician culture. By the second quarter of the 5th century BC, the Carthaginians stopped paying annual tribute to the Libyans to lease the land. Skulls identified as Phoenician were discovered west of Syracuse in Sicily. They were dolichocephalic, prognathius, and distinctly negroid affinities. In one way or another, Carthage came into control of Majorica, Minorica, Sardinia, western Sicily, the smaller Mediterranean islands, parts of Spain, and finally parts of North Africa. With a powerful people on the other side of the Mediterranean, rivalry with the Greeks soon gave way to conflict. Sicily became the combat zone from the 5th to the 3rd centuries BC. Apparently, King Hamilcar of the House of Mago took three years to gather his naval forces of 200 warships, 3,000 troop transporters, and an army of 300,000 men recruited from Africa, Spain, Sardinia, Corsica, Libya, and Gaul. They landed at Himera in Sicily and began to battle the Greeks. The conflict lasted all of one fateful day in 480 BC. The Carthaginians were utterly defeated. In 410 BC, war erupted once more in Sicily but with greater successes. Hannibal, also of the House of Mago, commanded the conquest of the cities. Salinius, Himera, and Syracuse. This was accompanied by a cruel destruction of those Greek colonial cities. He returned in 407 BC and destroyed Agrinentum, Gela, and Camarina. After much bloodshed, a peace treaty was agreed between Carthage and the Greeks in 383 BC. Sicily was divided between them with an agreed boundary. The empire building had far-reaching economic implications, especially for merchant shipping. The western part of the Mediterranean became, in effect, a Carthaginian lake. They controlled who may or may not sail there, with the very real threat of severe penalties being imposed on foreign sailors. Furthermore, there is a treaty signed in 509 BC between Carthage and Rome, where the Romans and their allies agreed to refrain from sailing beyond the beautiful promontory where this is, unless storms or an enemy force compel them to do so. Moreover, if a ship is driven despite itself beyond this headland, the crew are forbidden to buy or sell anything except what may be necessary to render the said ship seaworthy again or to offer a sacrifice. Of the goods themselves, gold, precious stones, local manufactured products, and slaves were shipped to Italy from Carthage. Malta, another of their colonies, had an industry in beautiful cotton cloths known for their fineness and softness. These were carried to markets in Africa. Corsica produced wax and honey and also exported slaves. One of the islands mined and smelted an unending supply of iron. Majorica and Menorca produced fruit and bread mules. In Spain, Carthage found another market for its manufactured goods. Carthage also had a flourishing land trade with other countries in Africa where they bought gold, salt, slaves, and dates. Herodotus specifically mentions that some of the gold came from a Libyan country, identified as Guinea, procured by Dumbarter. This same method of trade continued in use for 2,000 years. There are accounts of Carthage in exploration in the 6th or 5th centuries BC. Hanno, one of their admirals, commanded 60 ships that carried 30,000 Libya Phoenicians along the north and west coast of Africa. The large numbers of people were transported to establish new colonies, and the last of them were landed at Morocco as far south as Arguin. Hanno and the others continued their journey around the west coast of Africa and sailed past the Senegal River, noting that it abounded in crocodiles and hippopotami. There they encountered people, but as the document records it, they drove us away by throwing stones at us. The expedition sailed on passing forests of odoriferous trees. Furthermore, they witnessed the locals clearing the forest using slash and burn techniques. At night, they overheard local music of pipes, cymbals, drums, and shouts. Elsewhere, they saw a volcano. Finally, they encountered gorillas. They returned when their provisions failed them. Himlico, another sailor, led a maritime voyage to explore western Europe and the British Isles. 
the Reverend Michael Russell, a pioneer and Africanist, informs us that historians and geographers have long disputed as to the extent of the navigation which the ships of Carthage accomplished in the Atlantic Ocean. Some of the content with extending the limits of their voyages from the southern coast of the Britain on the north of the Cape Bojodur on the south, while others conferring upon them a share in the direct trade with the Baltic, conduct their ships to the mouth of the Vistula and the coast of Prussia. On the one hand, and on the other, the estuary of Gambia and the shores of Guinea, it is even maintained that they crossed to America and visited the borders of New World. Reverend Russell himself did not share the view that Carthage visited America and dismisses the idea as conjecture, being beyond fact and reasoning. He did, however, draw clear conclusions as to the extent of the Carthage and maritime activity. Her commercial relations would thus have extended over nearly the whole of the known world and would only have been surpassed by those of modern Europe since the discovery of America and of the passage to the east by the Cape of Good Hope. Unfortunately, the costs of the Carthaginian exploration and colonization schemes were borne by her colonies, especially her conquered African neighbors. Carthage imposed a harsh tribute upon them. The value of this sometimes amounted to half of their annual produce. This made the Carthaginians a hated people elsewhere in Africa and proved a decisive factor in their downfall. By the 3rd century BC, the city of Carthage was opulent and impressive. It had a population of 700,000 and may even have approached a million. The Greek and Roman accounts allow us to reconstruct a picture of the 23-mile circuit of towering walls that enclosed several imposing temples, a fortress, and many magnificent buildings. The city walls were of an extraordinary thickness and contained barracks for 20,000 soldiers, magazines for war material, stalls for 300 elephants, and stables for 4,000 horses. Lining both sides of the streets, lining both sides of three streets were rows of tall houses six stories high. The streets led on to their harbors. To the north and the west of the city lay the great suburb of Megara, full of gardens and villas associated with the idle rich. The forum was probably situated in the lower town near to the two ports. The war arbor was circular and had docks all around. Before each dock stood columns decorated with ionic capitals. This formed part of the colonnade that surrounded the entire harbor. In the center of the island stood an admiratory buildings and palace from which trumpeters would convey orders to the warships. The Carthaginian temples were lavish and lapis lazuli standing in front of them. The temple of Eshmun, i.e. Hemotep, was the richest in the city and was approached by 60 steps. Finally, Carthage boasted public restaurants, theaters, libraries, and baths. Mr. Bosworth Smith is emphatic in stating that Carthage was beyond doubt the richest city of antiquity. Her ships were to be found on all known seas, and there was probably no important product, animal, vegetable, or mineral of the ancient world which did not find its way into her harbors and pass through her hands of her citizens. Archaeological finds indicate that the streets ran at the right angles and were made of beaten earth, typically five to seven meters wide. The houses had washing or shower rooms with water cisterns, pipes, wastewater drains, and floors of mosaic tiles. They had living rooms with the white marble tesserae, mosaics, courtyards with mosaic floors, storerooms, and also staircases. The houses had impolu impluvia. The porticos had sloping roofs supported by stuccoed sandstone columns. In addition, there were res residential blocks exactly like ours today. Finally, the city had garbage collectors. Carthaginian control over the Mediterranean trade routes soon brought them into conflict with the newly rising power of Rome from the other side of the Mediterranean. The rivalry once more turned into conflict when, with the first of the Punic Wars. The confrontation began 264 BC on the island of Sicily. At the request of the city of Messina, the Carthaginians attempted to set up a garrison there. For some reason, no one knows why, the people of Messina switched sides and appealed to the Romans against Carthage. The first important battle began in Agrinitum in the following year. In 256 BC, the Romans struck against Africa itself. Using 330 vessels, they sailed from Sicily to Cape Bon and successfully ravaged the site. They were, however, recalled to Italy. Carthage, led by Hamilcar Barca, 
was forced to negotiate a peace settlement with the Romans in 255 BC, but the Roman demands were excessive. The hostilities continued. Xanthippus, a Greek mercenary, was instrumental in Carthaginian campaigns. He organized cavalry, foot soldiers, and elephants. They captured and imprisoned Regulus, the Roman consul. Rome suffered a series of naval disasters between 254 and 253 BC. Hannibal, Hannibal Hamilcar's son, raided the coast for, of Italy for six years beginning in 247 BC. More successes came in Sicily. Hamilcar commanded a series of campaigns between 246 and 242 BC that almost drove the Romans off the island. Carthage, however, suffered an unexpected and fatal naval defeat in 241 BC. Hamilcar received full powers from the Carthaginians to negotiate with Rome to sue for peace. The victorious Romans forced Carthage to renounce its claim to the colony of Sicily. After the war of 20,000 of Carthage's mercenaries remained in western Sicily. They were a bizarre mix of nationalities including Iberians, Gauls, Balearics, Greeks, and other Africans. Carthage refused to give them full pay and this culminated in another war. Spendios, a half-Greek and Matho, an African, led the rebellion. In addition, the mercenaries exploited the fact that the other Africans in the surrounding territories hated Carthage, seeing it as an oppressive regional power. These nations supported the rebels, seizing the opportunity to free themselves from the Carthaginian overlordship. Many women of these nations surrendered their jewelry. Enough money for the jewelry was raised to pay the mercenaries their back pay and to finance the uprising. Hamilcar Barca raised a force of 10,000 men to engage in the insurgents. In 238 BC, he captured Spendios and had him crucified. Matho was taken prisoner and also crucified. By this period, a tired and weakened Carthage relinquished Sardinia to Rome. Carthage reemerged, but in much reduced state. Hamilcar established a strong territorial presence in the southeast Spain and seized control of its rich mines. South of the Alicante, he built a new Carthage. Hasdrubal, the elder, succeeded him in 229 BC and signed a treaty with the Romans. Three years later, the provisions of the treaty are controversial and it contained a clause that a clause that delimited the territorial boundaries separating that which belonged to Carthage from that which belonged to Rome. Hasdrubal perished in 221 BC and was succeeded by Hannibal, his brother. A Celt-Iberian stabbed Hasdrubal to death. In 219 BC, Hannibal, perhaps the best-known personality in Carthage in history, see also page 115, seized Sagnitum in Spain. Polybius, the Roman historian, reported that, that this breached the treaty and was interpreted by the Romans as a declaration of war. A year later, the Second Punic War commenced. In May of that year, Hannibal raised an armed force of 90,000 men on foot and 12,000 men on horseback. By the summer, they reached Rowan. However, they were now a much reduced force of 50,000 soldiers, 9,000 horsemen, and 37 elephants. Celts and Gauls flocked to the standard, however, and increased their numbers. They hated Roman imperial rule and saw the Carthaginian campaign as a way of getting back at the Romans. Hannibal's forces crossed the Alpines. Hannibal's forces crossed the Alpine passes at the end of the year. Being in winter, it was difficult and costly crossing. Many people and animals unfamiliar with such cold died. From the north, they marched on Italy, however, penetrating deep into the Italian territory. They seized Cannae in 216 BC, killing 70,000 Roman soldiers. Carthage, on the other hand, lost 5,500 5, soldiers and 200 horsemen in the same campaign. Next, they marched in Rome, but were unable to breach the walls. They camped there for years. Sir James Fraser, the author of The Golden Bow, wrote, Hannibal hung with his dusky army like a storm cloud about to break, within sight of the sentinels of Rome. In 215 BC, he sent two officers to Sicily to seduce the local rulers to break their loyalties to Rome. The Romans, however, made inroads. By 210 BC, they destroyed Carthage's new allies in Sicily, and the following year, Scipio, the Roman general, Commanded an invasion in Spain. Commanded an invasion of Spain. 
A year later, the Roman army seized the gold and silver mines of that land, which was the basis of Carthage's wealth. In around 206 BC, a king of Numidia, an African state to the west of Carthage, changed alliances as Carthage began to lose. Allying himself with Rome, he persuaded Scipio to bring the war to Africa. In 204, Scipio invaded Africa, causing Hannibal and Mago, his brother, to leave Italy and return home. The Romans engaged them at the Battle of Zama in 202 BC. Assisted by 10,000 horsemen, supplied by Numidia, the Romans triumphed. Scipio had planned for and frustrated Hannibal's secret weapon, the use of elephants. The terms of the peace treaty of 201 BC were harsh. Carthage was compelled to return the lands that once belonged to Numidia. They were forbidden to make war on any people without the consent of Rome. They must hand over elephants and must not acquire others. They must abandon all ships except ten. Finally, they must pay a reparation of 10,000 talents over 50 years. Following the treaty, Scipio and the Carthaginian fleet burned. Carthage made some sort of recovery during this period with Hannibal and still at the helm. The business of the city was again as flourishing as it had ever been, says Mr. Reed. Again, ships sailed to the coast of Cornwall and Guinea. Again, the streets were lined with the workshops of industrious artisans The archaeological finds support the notion that the city recovered. Carthage even proposed to pay off the reparation due to Rome in ten years. The Romans, however, refused. Eventually, the Romans demanded that the Carthaginians hand over Hannibal. Instead, he fled into exile in 196 BC. The Romans began to have misgivings about the recovery of the African city was making. A Roman senator was very public in expressing these concerns. Cato, the elder, is reported to have ended such, had ended each and every speech in the Senate between 152 and 150 BC with the phrase, In any case, I am of the opinion that Carthage must be destroyed. It did not matter what the issue was that the Senate discussed, Cato would always bring the argument back to his pet hate, Carthage. Moreover, in 151 BC, the last of the 50 payments from Carthage was delivered. Rome now looked for a pretext to humiliate Carthage further. In 150 BC, they got their chance. Carthage counterattacked Numidia, who had abused Carthage for years while the Romans turned a blind eye. This allowed the Romans to claim that the Treaty of 201 had been breached. In the following year, Carthage sent an embassy to Rome to discuss the matter. The Romans demanded that Carthage hand over all weapons, catapults, cannonballs, and engines of war. Carthage complied. They were delivered to Utica, who by now had gone over the Roman side. The Romans then delivered their final terms to the Carthaginians. They demanded that the people of Carthage abandon their city and move inland from the sea to the distance of 15 kilometers. Carthage was about to be destroyed. Eventually, this news reached Africa with dramatic repercussions. Carthage went mad, says Mrs. Erskine. People were torn to pieces in the streets. Some Italians found there were tortured. And then the torrent was stemmed, and the Carthaginians rose to the full height of their greatness. They shut the gates and resolved to defend themselves to the last. But how was this to be done? There were no ships of the war in ports. The arsenals were empty. The stalls were where the elephants and horses were stabled, empty also. Without weapons, without any means of defense, but the strong walls. The Senate of Carthage declared war on Rome. In a very short time, an silent city was turned into a huge factory. Rome attacked in 149 BC. They besieged the city for three years. Eventually, they breached the walls and began the genocide. At least 250,000 people were slaughtered in the atrocity and 50,000 were sold into slavery. Some 500,000 volumes of the Carthaginian library disappeared. Some texts were handed over to the Numidians. The destruction of the literature is always a setback to civilization since accumulated knowledge dies with the destruction of each library. Mr. Bosworth Smith discussed one Carthaginian text that survived the Holocaust, penned by Mago. This work may indicate the standard of Carthaginian knowledge in general. What Aristotle was to the medieval philosophers and theologians that Mago seemed to have been, in measure, to the Italian agriculturalists. Varro, the most learned of the Romans and the author among 489 other publications of the most valuable treaties of ancient agriculture which we possess, 
quotes Mago as the highest authority on the subject, and other Roman writers have handed down to us with no less respect various maxims on the breeding and management of cattle, the care of poultry and of bees, the planting of forest trees, and the treatment of the vine and the olive, the almond and the pomegranate, all drawn from the same fountainhead. We honor, says Cumella, above all writers, Mago the Carthaginian, the father of husbandry. The final tragedy for the great African city came with Scipio's last act. Mrs. Erskine describes the final humiliation with pathos. The smoldering fires in Carthage were relit. The marbles were hacked. The temples spoiled. So thorough was the work of destruction that hardly one stone remained on another. Then the plow was passed over the blackened soil, and the final curse was pronounced. That Davidio, which dedicated the place to the infernal gods, the site of Carthage had stood for 700 years, was cursed. The land was never to yield a harvest. No human habitation was to be raised on ground given over to the spirits of darkness. Numidia Kingdoms have existed in Numidia since at least the 5th century BC. Diodorus Siculus reports that there were allies of the Carthaginians who also supplied troops for the Carthaginian army. Documents continued to mention kings and kingdoms for the next century and a half, and they all failed to give further details. The first Numidian ruler of which there is any detailed information is Navarus, who assisted Carthage against Rome during the First Punic War. Navarus supplied a cavalry contingent of 2,000 men to the Carthaginian side. For this, Hamilcar Barca rewarded him with the hand of his daughter in marriage. Originally, there were several Numidian kingdoms, of which two became important. Both were located to the west of Carthage in the regions of Algeria and the western Tunisia. The most westerly was of the Massicillian Numidians, whose territory extended as far as the west of the river Muluia. Their capital was the coastal city of Siga, where a famous three-story mausoleum stood. Its second capital was Serta. King Syphax was an important figure during the Second Punic War. He was probably the single most dominant figure in Numidian affairs, who also exercised power over lesser, lesser rivals. There are bronze coins struck during this time with the legend Syphax the King, written in Punic. He initially reported Rome during the war. He initially supported Rome during the war, but ended up allying with Carthage. In 206 BC, his forces annexed the rival and more easterly kingdom of the Massilian Numidians. The following year, he married Hasdrubal's Barca's daughter. The easterly kingdom of the Massilian Numidians was much smaller than its rival. It possessed a famous 3rd century BC tomb known as the Madrasin. During the Second Punic War, Gaia, its king, supported Carthage with troops. In 206 BC, Massinissa succeeded him to the throne. He initially supported Carthage but changed sides as Carthage began to lose. Syphax evaded his kingdom. Syphax invaded his kingdom and exiled him. Massinissa successfully persuaded Scipio, the Roman commander, to bring the war to Africa. In this in this way, he regained his throne in 203 BC and seized Sirta that year. This conquest unified the two major Numidian kingdom into one. Sirta became the capital of the unified kingdom. The terms of the peace treaty of 201 BC began Carthage and Rome required the Carthaginians to return to Massinissa, all the cities and territory held by him or his forefathers. In addition, over the next 50 years, Massinissa seized more and more of Carthaginian territory. His dream seems to have been the creation of the vast Numidian state from Morocco to Libya with Carthage as its capital. However, the Roman destruction of Carthage and their occupation of the site frustrated this grand ambition. Despite this, Massinissa proved a dynamic ruler who had a long and brilliant career. The Roman historians credited him with an agricultural revolution that transformed the kingdom. Before his time, the territory was wild and uncultivated, peopled by robbers and marauders. During his reign, the Numidians became one of the wealthiest people of the period, untroubled by intrigue and domestic strife. He received, the elephant si he received the elephant seeds from Carthage and incorporated their use into standard Numidian warfare. He spread the use of coinage throughout the kingdom, which was developed of the use of bronze and silver coins issued only in limited numbers by Syphax and his successor in the West. He patronized Greek and Roman scholars and... 
he patronized Greek and Roman scholars at his court and open schools. In addition, a new script developed in Numidia with only five of its characters derived from the Phoenician and is still used by Turegs of today. There are monuments in eastern Algeria and western Libya covered with these inscriptions. Punic, however, remained the language of the officials and scholars. After the fall of Carthage in 146 BC, his sons collected what was left of its libraries. The Numidians were much interested in the religious literature of Carthage and adored Baal Haman, perhaps its chief, di perhaps its chief deity, and also the goddess Tanit. This became reflected in the fact that every important town in the kingdom had a sanctuary to Baal, uh, had a sanctuary to Baal Haman, constructed at its gateway. The sanctuary near the royal residence of Serta is the best known surviving example. Finally, there are surviving stelae dedicated to Tanit. Serta, Zama, and Makthar became important cities. They were cosmopolitan and included Greek and Roman populations. After the fall of Carthage, some of, the, some of its survivors fled there, adding to the cultural melting pot. They were well received and found employment. The city dwellers typically wore long, finely pleated robes of muslin and were gathered with the wide belt. Covering this, they wore cloaks with sleeves open down the front. The women wore large collars and had pendulous earrings that almost touched their shoulders. Some wore large pointed bonnets. The, clo the clothing points to the luxurious and urban lifestyle. Great monuments survive from this period. There are stelae and serta that share features with those of Carthage. There are also three famous monuments that have received much scholarly attention. The so-called Tomb of the Christian Woman, located west of the Algiers, and the Madrasin, north of the Ares, were enormous round towers. Step pyramids crowned both the monuments. Columns with Doric capitals were built into the outer walls. The mausoleum of Adabon, son of Yetmatadef, stands at the foot of the hill, at Duga. Built in a podium of five steps, it had three stories. The columns show Egyptian and Greek capitals. In addition, it had bilingual Punic and Libyan inscription now housed in the British Museum. In addition to the three cities of Serta, Zama, and Makthar, the Reverend Russell wrote that, even at the present day, i.e. in 1835 A.D., there, there are found in southern Numidia the remains of towns and castles which present an air of great antiquity. Mesipsa succeeded Masinissa to the throne in 148 B.C. and reigned for a lengthy 40 years. He abandoned the expansionism of his predecessor but continued his drive for agricultural expansion. It must be stressed that he ruled a vast territory. From the river Maluia in the west to as far east as the Roman-controlled province surrounding Carthage, his authority was felt. 